Though I love my new sneakers, I love my new sneakers. Oh, I gotta show you my new sneakers, cause I love my Converse All Stars. <laughs> Hey folks, how y'all? I'm sorry. I, I just said I'm just so excited. I got my Converse All Stars that I've always wanted, and I got them on sale on clearance at like half price. And I'm just so happy. I just thought I'd share with you for the first 30 seconds. 30 seconds is up. Done. 30 seconds over. Okay, folks, it's time to make a phone call. Do 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 nine one one nine one. One. Hello, 911. This is Matthew Street. I have an emergency. Yes, yes, it's me. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, right, we'll talk about that later. Hey, anyway, I want to tell you about something really cool because we are going back to the 80s for this video. Yes, we are. We're going back to the 80s and with the old technology and everything, okay? Because there were no smartphones or iPhones back then, right? Yep. Anyway, I hope you enjoy the video. Welcome everybody to the Matthew Street channel. I am your host, Matthew Street. Let's have some fun. Goodbye. <laughs> anyway, folks, <laughs> sorry, enough of that. But I am going back in time a little bit. I'm getting nostalgic here. This video goes back to the mid 1980s. And I know you kind of know what it's already about already. It's, it's not really a rant. It's kind of a, kind of a positive rant in a way. I guess I would say that folks, I just saw a great, great television special. The Greatest Night of Pop, it was called, something like that. I'm sorry I didn't write it down. Okay, I should have. Anyway, people after person after people after person after person after people kept saying to me, Matthew, have you seen this new special, this new documentary on Netflix about the We Are The World song and how it all came about and, and what happened that night? And I went, no, I haven't, but I'd sure like to see it. And sure enough, folks, I finally saw it, and I just thought I would do a quick, not even a review of it. I'm not here to tell you to see it or not see it. I want to say, yeah, I recommend you see this great, great documentary. It's absolutely fabulous, especially if you're from that era, you're of that age where you were around back then, and you remember many of the artists who were part of that special night, because, folks, it really was a special night. The night was January 28th, 1985. Can you believe it's been... Wow, over 39 years now, we're coming up on the 40th anniversary and, you know, beginning of next year. I can't believe it. That was the year I got married, May of that year. May of that year, I also was the first time I saw Bruce Springsteen live in concert. I mean, I think of these things back in 1985 that happened, but that was the big one, getting married to Mrs. Street. I think that was the big one. And folks, what a night it was. Now, anyone that's anybody, you know anything about music, you must have some familiarity with We Are The World, the song We Are The World, and the group USA For Africa, and what they were trying to do to bring awareness, to bring food, to bring supplies to the people of Ethiopia in Africa and other African nations to help with starvation and people in need. And it was a great thing. But, you know, it wasn't the first time something like that was done because you have to go back in my opinion, one of the first, if not the first, was the great George Harrison concert for Bangladesh back in 1971, where he brought so many great musical artists together for that charitable, charitable event. And I think that was the first, if not one of the first, it had to be. And there were many things that have come since. And the We Are The World USA For Africa song and album and event, which brought millions of dollars to help with starvation and suffering in Africa overseas was you had the Band-Aid group. Remember that one? The United Kingdom artist, musical artist in 84, late latter half of 84. Bob Geldof organized that, brought all these British artists together. They did the song, you know, Do They Know It's Christmas, which was a big, big hit and raised lots of money. And then um, what Band-Aid did and Bob Geldof inspired Lionel Richie, Harry Belafonte, Michael Jackson, Quincy Jones, the great producer. But it was Harry Belafonte, the great Harry Belafonte, who came up with the, the seed, the idea, when he saw what was happening with Band-Aid in the UK, he said, we gotta do something here in the United States. The US, US artists, musical artists, need to get together and do something. So 
It all came together on that night on January 28th. And folks, I'm not gonna go through the whole documentary with you. We'd be here all night. The many fabulous, wonderful moments you need to see and experience watching this great documentary. But I wanna just tell you a couple of things. Artists were told when they came in, there was a big sign over the door, check your ego at the door. And they did. And no assistance, no hangers on, no, you know, spouses or girlfriends, boyfriends, whatever. Just the artists were allowed into the studio. They had to pull this idea together fast because it was less than a month before the American Musical Awards, which happened that night, January 28th, 1985, that the seed was planted. So they had to come up with a song. They had, it had to be arranged. The vocal parts had to be arranged. All the um, musical parts had to be arranged. And they had one shot, one night to get it right, get the people there and get it done and make it excellent. And it was a, it's amazing in this documentary how they did that. Lionel Richie and Michael Jackson wrote the song. Now they wanted Stevie Wonder to help write the song. And Lionel Richie, great parts in this documentary about how Lionel tried to leave messages and calls for Stevie Wonder and he couldn't get him on the phone and Stevie didn't return his calls. So Lionel tried, but they couldn't get him. So Lionel and Michael Jackson ended up writing the song and they did a great job. I mean, is it the, you know, the greatest melodic song of all time? No, but for what it is, an anthem, you know, a positive, simple anthem with a simple message to give, to help, to open your hearts, I think it hits home and I think it's a wonderful song in that regard. Now, it, it, a demo was put together with the uh, musicians in the studio, Michael Jackson singing and stuff. They sent out these cassettes, like 50 of them, to all these, the famous, most famous, well-known, popular musical artists of the day. They got a letter with it and a cassette and they were just hoping for the best. And they were hoping that the artists would show up that night after the American Music Awards and they could have a great group of people. And boy, did it ever work out and did they ever. And 47 stars approximately, I don't have exact numbers here, but 47 stars showed up. They were the top artists of the day, as I said. They went to A&M Studios in Los Angeles. After the American Music Awards ended, cars were pulling up. The artists started arriving after the show. Some of them with drivers bringing them in at shows. Some of them driving themselves in, like Kenny Rogers. Bruce Springsteen, I guess, drove in on his GTO. I think they said he's driving a GTO. He comes driving in. Really funny. And, and, and it just goes through the whole thing, how they put all the vocals together, the parts, who was to sing what part, who was partnered up with who to sing each song. Fascinating, fascinating documentary, how it was all put together so fast with a matter of hours. The Music Awards ends like at 11 p.m. The artists start showing up at A&M Studios and the whole thing went till eight o'clock the next morning. And that's when Lionel Richie said he got home. Finally, eight o'clock the next morning. Amazing, amazing stuff. Some funny parts in it. I'll just tell you a few and then get out of here. Stevie Wonder, he wants to put some Swahili lines in the song. <laughs> and some of the other artists are like, what? You know, what's going on here? And, and, and then someone had to remind Stevie that where this, was, this famine was taking place in Ethiopia, they don't speak Swahili, Steve. So it wouldn't do, you know, what's the, they ended up working it out and putting some other new lyrics into it and they kind of bumped that Swahili thing aside. But while they're badgering this all out with Swahili and have it or not have it, Waylon Jennings pretty much says, well, this old country boy don't know how to speak no Swahili, so I'm out of here. And it shows him, you can see him in one of the film shots leaving, getting down off the podium and walking out. So he leaves. And there's another funny part when Cindy Lauper is doing her solo part and it's, they're nailing it. She's with Huey Lewis and Kim Carnes and she's nailing her part, but they hear background noise. What it ends up being is Cindy's wearing so much jewelry. Remember Cindy Lauper from back in the Girls Just Want to Have Fun Day? She had all kinds of bracelets on both arms and big necklaces and big loopy earrings flapping all over the place. And she's making all kinds of noise. They finally figure out it's her jewelry making noise. A lot of it costume jewelry. So she apologizes and she's taking off piles and piles of jewelry and throwing it on the floor and the noise stops. you got a great part where um, someone talks about Ray Charles needs to go to the bathroom. So Stevie Wonder says, oh, I know where it is. I'll help you get there. And Stevie Wonder takes Ray by the arm and Stevie's showing Ray 
where the bathroom is. And everyone got a big kick out of it because they're like, well, it's literally the blind leading the blind. <laughs> it was just a funny, funny moment. You'd love this, folks. You would love this documentary. Or at one point, Bob Dylan's having a little trouble with how he's gonna phrase his part, his solo part. You know, he's, he's feeling very insecure and uncomfortable. You can tell because all these great vocalists around him and he's Bob Dylan, he has his own unique style. And he's not sure how to handle it and how to do it, believe it or not. But he, 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 him and Stevie wanted to get off in a corner with a piano. And Stevie is such a great mimic. He knows how to mimic other people's vocal parts that he sings it to Bob in Bob Dylan's inflection and in Bob Dylan's style. And Bob finally gets what he needs to do and he, he nails his part. It's absolutely wonderful. Uh, man, eh, eh, Paul Simon turns to the crowd at one point. And he says, oh, I hope a bomb doesn't go off here or John Denver's going to be back on top again, which was kind of a funny line. But I made me feel kind of melancholy as being a fan of John Denver, because I know John Denver's career. And John Denver was the artist who should have been there, because if you look at John Denver prior to 1985 and what he did throughout his career, going back to the early 70s, maybe even late 60s, John was so involved in environmental causes and causes to help wildlife and animals causes to help the homeless, causes to feed the hungry. John Denver was on the ground floor of all that stuff years before We Are The World. So the one musical artist who definitely should have been there was John Denver. Even if he didn't sing a solo part, he should have been there. And uh, But it was a funny line from Paul Simon. Um, Diana Ross starts a whole floodgates opening when she goes up to, uh, Diana Ross coming up to you and asking for your autograph. She goes up to Daryl Hall and says, Hey, Daryl, I'm really a fan of yours. Can I have your autograph? Sign my sheet music. And Daryl's like taken aback by this. Diana Ross asking me. He signs it, but then it opens the floodgates. Everybody loosens up and everybody's asking everybody. All the stars are asking for each other's autographs on their sheet music so they can preserve it. That was a wonderful moment. But the real melancholy part was Diana Ross. God bless her. I'm not a big fan of Diana Ross. I own a couple of Supremes CDs or albums. That's about it. But she, she's crying at the end of the session and someone asks her, Diana, why are, you, why are you crying? What's the matter? She goes, I just don't want this to end. I don't want this moment with all these artists getting along and working together for a common cause to end. I thought that was a beautiful moment. I mean, I can't even name all the artists over there. I've named some of them in my little dissertation here. Huey Lewis, Bob Dylan, Springsteen. I, I put a list up here in front of me. Ray Charles, Smokey Robinson, Lindsey Buckingham. Uh, Tina Turner, Cindy Lauper, as I said, Lionel Richie, Michael Jackson, Kenny Loggins, Hall and Oates. You got members of the Jackson Five there: Billy Joel, Dion Warwick, Sheila E., Stevie Wonder, Harry Belafonte, Willie Nelson, Paul Simon, Kim Carnes, James Ingram, Al Jarreau, Steve Perry from Journey, Pointer Sister. I can't even think of them all, folks. So many wonderful artists from all different genres of music: rock and roll, R and B, pop dance. I mean, they're all there. They're all together working as a team. It was wonderful. And some at the time were new artists, like Cindy Lauper was fairly young and new in her 20s. And then you had some legends there, like Ray Charles and Bob Dylan and, you know, some of the, uh, Willie Nelson, you know, you had people like that mixed in with the brand new artist of the day. But they all, but I'm going to say this, and here's my little mini positive rant at the end before I leave you. The one commonality I noticed watching this special, and I'm going to be totally honest with you, half the artists that were there at We Are The, you know, we Are the World session, I don't own a lick of their music. I don't have any of their CDs, albums, probably never will. They're just not artists that I'm into. I'm not even going to name them here. I'm just going to say there's a lot of artists that were there that night out of those 47 artists or so. I'll never buy their music. I'm not into their music. But I will say this. The one commonality I came away from, emotionally when I left this special was every one of those artists were talented. They were dripping and drenched in talent, musical talent, whether they could sing, write, play, solo, part of a group, whatever they were that night, everyone in that room had talent, pure, raw talent. Now, can you say the same if something like that was ever attempted in 2024? right now? Yeah, you could get some legends now in 20, Lionel Richie, God bless him, he's still with us. 
uh, Billy Joel is still with us, Daryl Hall and John Oates. You know, we, we could go on and on and on about people who are still here who we, we could bring in today that are considered legends. Cindy Lauper, God bless her, is in her 60s. She was a new young 20-something-year-old then. We could bring her in now, and she's a legend. But I'm saying we may be able to get some legends from back in the day, but new, current, hot artists mixed with them would they have that much talent that was in that room in 1985? I say no way. I say no way. And there were some great newer artists today, like Lady Gaga, she can sing. There were some great artists out there. I'm not saying that, so don't criticize me for this. And I have a lot of respect for many artists today that are out there, but I'm sorry. There is no way you could take today's, go to the top 40 right now, and I'm not even gonna name artists and shame anybody, the garbage, the crap that is in the top 40 today. And you're going to tell me that you could pull some of those people together with some legends and have just as much talent in the same studio as they had in 1985 for We Are The World? I don't think you can do it, folks. Because even though I may not own records by a lot of those people in that room, many I do, and I love them, and many I don't. I'll never buy their records. But I have buku much respect for every artist who was in that room in 1985 recording We Are The World. They were all pure talent. Whether you like their music or not, they were talented. I can't say the same that for, say the same for today. I just can't. I'm sorry. I can't. I'm not, I don't even want to name artists because I'll end up going on a rant, but the filth in the lyrics today, some of the genres of music and what they sing about, what they do, the presentation they put up on a stage or in a video that is absolutely disgusting that you wouldn't want your child under the age of 18, 17 even see, let alone young children. And they're putting this garbage out there to the world. You know, the stuff we thought was a little risque back in 1985, it doesn't even hold a candle. It's like, it's like a walk in a, in, a, in a parish center or church center compared to what's coming out today. I know I sound like an old crotchety old fart. You can call me whatever you want, but I know I'm right, folks. The talent from 1985 musically in that room can never be matched in 2024. You know, you can pull in some legends. You can pull in a couple of few good artists from today that really have pure talent. But for the most part, to grab artists off that top 40 today and stick them in a studio and tell me they're going to have as much talent. No, they're garbage. Many of them. Disgusting. Filth, crud, terrible. Sorry, sorry, that's the way I feel. That's the way, uh-huh, uh-huh, I like it. Uh-huh, uh-huh, that's the way, uh-huh, uh-huh. I'm going back in time, going back in time. Oh, yeah, yeah, get me to 1985, please. Get me out of this hellscape of music on the top 40 today. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Dial the destiny, dial the destiny. Thank you, I love you all so much. The music today is pretty lousy compared to then. And ha, 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 ha. <laughs> I'm sorry. I had a little too much cappuccino and a beer and some chocolate shakes and <laughs> chocolate. <laughs>